Chapter 7 Morning light slanted in through the window, falling heavily across the foot of Jackin's blanket. He woke and kicked the blanket off, then lay still for a moment, trying to enjoy the feel of a mattress and pillow. A year is a long time to go without mattress or pillow. They had done what they could in the wild to stay alive, to make themselves comfortable. And comfort aside, it had been wonderful. What am I thinking? There had been the loss of his beloved dragon, real fear, scrabbling from meal to meal, the need to always keep out of sight. In the mountains, all he'd cared about was staying alive and getting home. Yet not quite a week home in the nursery, and here he was suddenly wishing he could go back. Now that time shone in some sort of golden light, like a miracle. And miracles, by their very nature, only happen once and are gone. Wake up, lazy legs! It was Aki, her sending snaking into his head. I'm already up and eating breakfast. The sending bubbled with the dark, popping red of a cup of tack, though neither of them drank the dragon blood based drink anymore. Aki! His sending was nearly a shout. It had been too many days without her constantly in his head. That was what he missed more than anything, what had made the year in the mountains wonderful. But still, he had to ask Why are we sending? Lacarn's already safely away in the barn. Karina says he's been there all night. Must have been a hatching. He won't be able to hear us, and no one else can. I'm there, he said, getting out of bed. What? Erikin sat straight up in the talk bunk next to Jackins. Breakfast, Jackins said, a finger to the side of his nose. Smell it. I'm there. You coming? Erikin shook his head, then turned over, showing only his rounded back. Jackins shrugged. Five days of Erikin's back was enough. If Erikin wanted no part of him, then he'd let the friendship go, though he did wonder what had happened in the year he'd been away to change the always pleasant boy he'd known into this sullen, angry stranger. It can't just be the Bond thing, can it? Putting on his sandals, Jackin stood. He had enough problems without making Eric in another one. Eric was already up and pulling on his shorts. I'm with ya. Jackin grinned at him. At least Eric had a sunny disposition, unlike sullen slack and my back to you, Eric. Breakfast. That's the answer. It's always the answer. Jackin said. To what question? Eric asked. Jackin laughed. To every one of them. At the same time, he unleashed ascending toward the common room where Aki was waiting. Get some blizzard eggs ready for me. He sent a bright red bubbling landscape to her. He wanted to say more, but he'd save that for later. A rushing, gushing river of color came back from her, burbling away. Why is she so happy? Eric laughed. For a moment, Jackin was confused having forgotten he'd been speaking aloud to the moon-faced boy. Then he slapped Eric on the back. Any more questions? Breakfast, every one of them, Eric said. It had hardly been funny the first time, but the two boys laughed all the way to the breakfast room, leaving their sullen, snoring bunkmates behind. As far as Jackin could tell, everyone but Eric and Slack, and Lacarn, still out in the barn, was already in the dining room when the clanging breakfast bell rang out. It didn't interrupt the noisy commentaries at the twelve tables. Breakfast was hardly a quiet affair, and Jackin was only just getting used to it again. Each table was ruled by the large ceramic tack pot in which the rich red drink brewed. The older men tended to sit together. That left the younger nursery workers at their own tables. One table had been set aside for the solitaries, who preferred not speaking at breakfast. There were three of them, and they ate as far from one another as possible. Jackin had considered it on his first morning back, but Aki had convinced him it would raise more questions than they wanted to answer as he had not been a solitaire before. Jackin sat down next to Aki, who passed him a plate of eggs without a word or sending, but she smiled, flicking her long dark braid over her right shoulder as a kind of welcome. She was wearing a gold band around the bottom of the braid, and a matching gold band on her wrist. It had been a year since she'd had such things to wear, except for twists of wildflowers. Jackin remembered the wildflowers with a sudden sweet longing. Ruefully, he smiled back at her, saying nothing. Aki sent a tickling, colorful sequence of rainbows into his mind. I thought we said, he whispered, and when she glared at him, he looked down at his plate. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, she whispered back, though she hardly seemed sorry. The exchange was so quick and so hushed, no one else noticed. Jackin took some eggs, a slice of mellow, and a cup of minty tea. When Trico passed the platter of meat along, Jackin shook his head, almost shuddering. Not that hungry, he said. Ew, he used to be hungry all the time, Trico said. It must be lead. He drew the word out, to the delight of the rest of the table. But it had nothing to do with love, or hunger. Of course, Jackin couldn't tell them the real reason. He just couldn't eat lizard meat anymore. 
Lizards might not send with the power of their larger brothers, the dragons, but their minds were full of whispery, shadowy, pale sendings that flitted in and out of Jackin's mind whenever he passed one by. Eating lizard meat would be like eating a relative, a silly, slightly addled relative, though Jackin was fine with the unfertilized eggs, or with crystals, the translucent insects, dipped in egg and batter. He wondered if he could teach Karina that one. After his first sip of tea, Jackin looked up and forced a smile. Sleep well? He said it to the entire table, but he meant it for Aki. She sent him a rude bit of color, full of snags and sparkles, like a mind belch. The sending made him laugh, and that was so inappropriate, he immediately covered it up with a cough, as if he were choking on the eggs. Looking down at the table demurely, Aki said loudly, I don't know about anyone else, but I slept like a baby, easier on a mattress in bed than the stone floor of a cave. And you? He sent a mind belch back at her, and steadfastly refused to apologize. At that point, Slack came into the dining hall and joined them, sitting at the far end of the table, which was then awash in complaints about snoring roommates, pillows that needed new feathers, slats missing in beds, the usual. And you, Slack said suggestively, pointing at Jackin. You came to bed awfully late last night. Ooh. The comment ran around the table, and suddenly everyone stared and grinned at Aki. Reddening, she set her lips together so tightly they looked like a thin scar. Her actual embarrassment served as great camouflage. Jackin swallowed quickly. He'd been out late again in the inky barn and run back to the bond house just before dark after. He hadn't seen Lacarn that time, but if Aki was right, the old man must have been crouched down with an about-to-lay hen. He reminded himself to be more careful. Still, he had to deal with Slack's accusation. Stomach problems, Jackin said making a sour face and pointing to his belly. Not used to all this rich food. He rubbed his palm over the offending stomach, but no one seemed convinced. And really, how bad could it be if they think Aki and I are together at night? It would give us more chance to move out. Just then, Karina came out of the kitchen and overheard him. She stood in the doorway, hands on her hips, glaring, though her face gave her away as she tried to hide a smile. Jackin saw her and gulped. Rich, good food, Jackin amended loudly. She came over and clouded him on the head with her open hand. Nice save, Aki said, with a picture of a drowning man being lifted from a river by a very large red dragon. It set the man down on a beach, then clouded him gently with a paw. He grinned at her. Nothing, he sent to her, as is important as breakfast. His sending was bright and full of oval balloons, like giant eggs. Aki laughed out loud, and the others, thinking she was laughing belatedly at Karina's blow to Jackin's head, laughed with her. After breakfast, and after checking the chores list, Aki called Jack into the side door. We really have to stop our sendings, she warned quietly, or we're going to make them all suspicious. They're already suspicious, he whispered back. They're suspicious that we've pair bonded. Lacarn probably told someone about that kiss. Wouldn't you be suspicious of two people off together for a year, keeping warm in caves? He shrugged, smiling at the memory. And one of them going walk about at night? Where were you? We can't afford to let them suspect that we... Communicate without words, or can go outside during dark after. She turned away from him, sending, You really are exasperating. Wait a minute. His hand was on her shoulder. You're the one who keeps sending, not me. I know, I know. I said we. It's just so easy. She shrugged off his hand. See, she sent. We can both shrug. And opened the door, looking out into the glaring light. I think Slack is already guessing. Not Slack. He's not that smart. He's just jealous of me, that's all. Erican's too angry about something else to be guessing anything. The rest don't know either of us well enough, except... She spun around. Except? Old Lacarn, of course. She glared daggers at him. I can handle him. You're the one who has problems dealing with him. I wish I knew why. He's really all hoff and no harm. That was something nursery folk said about male dragons. Jackin's face scrunched up, the way it did whenever he was going to say something hurtful. Maybe he never harmed you, he began. But there's not a boy in the nursery who hasn't felt his heavy hand. He thinks a bang on the head or arm or back is a good teaching tool. He's only treating you the way dragon studs treat them young males, Aki said. That's all. And me worse than the all the others combined. Sometimes, Aki told him, boys whine too much. She turned and walked out the door. He raced after her. Where are you going? To the inky barn. To check on Oracle and the hatchling. She kept walking, a fast, long stride. She was fine last night, and if there's a change, we'd know because Oracle would have sent to me, or you. Aki stopped suddenly looking at him over her shoulder, glaring. Oracle is a dragon, not a doctor! She resumed walking. You're not a doctor either, Aki, he shot back cuttingly. 
Not a real one. That was too close to the bone. Too close to what she feared the most. Aki rounded on him angrily. It was easier getting mad at him than getting mad at the world. I'm the nearest, almost doctor this place has. That's why visiting the quarantine dragons is on my list of chores, not yours. She felt taut, like stretched wire. Lacarn and the men know I'm the one they have to go to for medical knowledge, especially now, with the embargo. Lacarn says that though medical ships are allowed through, few have actually come. I didn't mean... She suspected that at least was true, but couldn't stop herself from saying, You never do. He put his hand out beseechingly, as if he wanted to touch her. Instead, he said, We never fought out there. He gestured vaguely toward the mountains. Her anger ebbed, her face softened. She took a deep breath. We fought all the time out there, Jackin. He shook his head. Not really. Not fought. We argued. But we always agreed on the important things. The life or death matters. And there were a lot of those. A soft breeze touched Jackin's face, lifting the hair on his forehead, then letting it fall again, almost obscuring his eyes. Watching him, Aki suddenly felt terribly young and vulnerable. But she couldn't let herself feel that way. Too much was resting on her shoulders, and it frightened her. She wanted him to understand. Jackin! She was ready to tell him about the rope and the lab and how she'd gotten Karina to find a way to get her there, and that only this morning Karina said there's a truck coming to take her off. Today. Jackin, about the nursery! We're safe here, Aki. Safe from the wardens and the rebels and the trogs. We're home. It's where we belong. I've finally, just this minute, figured it out. We don't really have to do anything about the dragons, you know. Just keep the secret safe. If it's safe, so are we. And so are the dragons. So why are we still arguing? And then the moment to confide in him. The moment to tell him how, all on her own, she'd made plans to go to the city. To work on the most important problem Ostar had. That moment was gone. Her fear and her anger flooded back. Because... Because after a year of freedom, we're not just back home, we're back in Bond. She turned away and walked off. There's no more Bond on Ostar 4, he called after her. Haven't you been listening? She sent back a loud and very clear hot pink landscape with streaks of red. Oh, I've been listening, but that's not what I heard, she called over her shoulder. Then, using two hands, she pulled the squalling door of the inky barn open and clumped inside. We are more in Bond than ever, she said, before slamming the door in his face.